You have just seen a short clip of a story regarding, it's a real story of a man called Richard Wombrandt and that little boy in this animated but true story of his son Mihai who was visiting the father in prison. The place was Romania and it was the year roughly around 1950s. This video clip shows how badly the whole world needs grace. Not only the people in that video clip were prison uh, keepers, but also upon people of God. And that prisoner you saw in that video clip is none other than Richard Wombrandt, a pastor who knew how to exercise grace in the midst of ungrace. And today I want to share with you our topic about Jesus, His amazing grace. How amazing it is and he came to show grace and the message for Christmas this year has to do with grace and so today I want to talk something about the grace of our Lord Jesus there will not be enough time to talk about everything but I wanted to for today to get a simple understanding of the basic idea of grace and how it is operated. And so, grace is a word that all of us have heard every day in our lives. We probably hardly ever think about what it means when we go to a car park in Singapore you have what is called a grace period. Ten minutes, that's grace. Well, it simply means that the government will not charge you for ten minutes of parking. So we know this word grace is everywhere. But what does it really mean? And uh, we also hear it in church. And I want to give you a few key words so that as you hear what is being preached this morning, you will understand that I'm referring to a few key import ideas. And the first word that you need to know about grace is favor. Favor. That means someone shows you a favor or do you a favor. Or when you ask people for a favor, you are actually asking for grace to be extended. Number two, the key word, the same key word is the word undeserved. That means any favor you will be received that is undeserved, you didn't earn it, you didn't pay for it. In fact, you not only don't deserve it, you cannot deserve it. Then we call it grace. There's a third word that is very important to know is the word mercy. Mercy is a form of grace which means we do not deserve treatment for the wrong we have done. But we receive mercy. In other words, somebody overlook my mistake. That is mercy. When I deserve to be punished but someone took the punishment from me and therefore extended Freedom from punishment for me, that is called mercy. So, every time you hear about grace, it is the flip side is called mercy. There are two sides, two different sides of the same thing. Grace and mercy go together. And only in Jesus, the Bible says, mercy and truth met together. That Mercy and truth or mercy and justice cannot meet together. 
the opposites except at the cross. So grace is a word we need to focus on today because we hear it very often, but we hardly practice it because we don't quite fully understand. Now, grace is also divine in nature. It comes from Christ. The fullness of grace comes only from Christ. There's a uh, well-known preacher called Gordon MacDonald, and he had this to say. He says, the world can do almost anything as well, or even better than the church. But only one thing the world cannot do, it cannot offer grace. And so, grace can only be offered by the church and by Christ. The second thing we need to know about grace is that we can never learn grace by interpreting the law of God in a legalistic manner. That means by the outward for forms. But when we lack the inward substance, grace cannot be practiced and it cannot be offered in the context of a set of laws because the nature of law is that it must be executed to see justice. Grace is a different side. It's got something that supersedes the law. And grace is one of the most difficult things to understand because many of us are so used to doing things by law. No, it's not that the law is bad. It's just that the law has to be learned and that the law has to be uh, executed to have a decent society. So, our, the government cannot go by grace. The government go law by law. In other words, if you break a traffic rule and you go to a traffic police department and you say, can I explain my situation, hoping to get some grace, and you can expect no grace because the government has to operate law by law. It's not whether it's good or bad. It is a fact of life. So grace is an entirely different uh, perspective altogether. And in many ways, it seems to contradict the rule of law. That's why it's quite difficult to grasp the concept of grace and yet appreciate the rule of law. So this morning, I'm going to try to do justice to this uh, principle of grace. There is one thing that I put in my note here is that God offers grace unconditionally. The word is offer. You know, for an offer to become reality, grace has to be offered by someone who has authority. And only God can offer grace. Who does he offer grace to? To all. It's unconditional. Now, the offer is unconditional. To execute this so that it becomes a benefit to us as the recipients, we must be willing to receive. And uh, in order to receive, there are conditions. There are two key conditions in the Word of God in order to receive this offer. Now, let me make it very clear. The offer is unconditional. That means to everybody of all times. And it's offered by Jesus. But I must be willing to receive it. And to receive it, there are conditions. Two conditions. The Bible says that if you want to come and receive the grace, I must come with a humble heart. Because God resists the proud and gives grace only to the humble. That means I cannot come along and say, I want to set my terms. No, God says, 
you come by his terms. I cannot come proudly, I have to be humble. I, might, I have to humble myself. The second thing, I need to exercise by faith. Then I can, I'm willing to exercise faith in God's promise and offer of grace. And then, once I come by faith, believing that God is offering me grace, and I come with a humble heart, then God fulfills the offer. He makes the offer ours. In other words, he then makes the gift a reality. So there's an offer which is unconditional. The recipient <clears throat> don't have to earn it. It's free of charge, but you have to come with a certain attitude, humility, and faith. We do so, God then transmits the grace into our lives, then it becomes a reality. So the offer is unconditional. That means it's for all. You, it doesn't matter how bad we are. In fact, the, it covers all. The worst people are the people who appreciate grace the most. So this is how grace operates. <clears throat> But first of all, in my introduction, I want to tell you that there is a grace deficit in the whole world. The whole world is hungry for grace. So in Madrid, in Spain, some years ago, a father who had chased his son out of the house felt remorse, and so he wanted to be reconciled to his son. So he put up an advert in a local newspaper called El Liberal. And the advertisement goes like this. Paco, that's the son's name. It's a common name in, in Spain. And so in the advertisement, it says, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana on Tuesday at noon. Meet me at Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Papa. All is forgiven. Papa. You know this word forgiven is a very important key word as well. All is forgiven. That's grace. Came Tuesday. This man arrived at Hotel Montana only to find 800 pacos waiting to be reconciled to the father. 800 of them waiting, hungry for grace to be forgiven. That has been forgiven. So there is a deficit for, for, for grace. This is a great story by that well-known writer, Ernest Hemingway, who himself felt a deep hunger for grace. A man who did not receive grace. A man whose mother said on his birthday, send him a birthday cake, and attached to the, in the same box was a gun, a pistol. And uh, telling him that because of the deficit of grace, he either make it up or he can use this weapon. It was the same weapon that his own father had used to shoot himself because his father also did not experience grace. So there's a grace deficit worldwide. <clears throat> Everyone is hungry for grace. And therefore we have, that's why Jesus came. So I want to read to you what the Apostle John wrote <clears throat> regarding Jesus' mission of bringing grace into our world. It's amazing grace. In verse 14, of John's Gospel, chapter 1. It says, And the word, Jesus, 
the word, the communication of God's grace. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, says John. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. Underline the word full. The grace is full of grace and truth. I'm only going to focus on grace this morning. I won't be talking about the truth part. Verse 15, John bore witness to him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, and for he was before me. In other words, John the Baptist was saying, I've been talking about this particular person, about the grace that this person is coming. He's before me. That means he's pre-existent. He's God. And verse 16, And of his fullness, that's our key verse, and of the fullness of Jesus, we have all received, and we all can receive, what? Grace upon grace, or grace for grace. Now, verse 16 says, and of his fullness. Now, some of the latest manuscripts says, the word instead of and of, it says, and because of his fullness, because of the fullness of grace, and because Jesus is full of grace, he's overflowing with grace, and because of this overflowing fullness of grace, we have all received. It's sufficient for all to receive. Not only what kind of grace, grace upon grace. And my focus today will not only be talking about grace that Jesus brings, but what is this grace upon grace? And uh, <clears throat> so the first thing it, we know from today's passage is that grace comes from Jesus, and he's full of it. And we are here because of his fullness of grace. We can all receive that grace, not only receive that overflowing grace, but we'll, the kind of grace we receive would be called grace upon grace. One measure of grace after another, unlimited supply of grace. And because we are going to learn how to receive it, I'm going to ask God to help us do so. Father in heaven, we are people who are used to rule of law. We do things law by law. And Lord, you know it's difficult for us to switch, to understand. The principles of grace are seem so contradictory in a measure. So today, Holy Spirit, help us to wrap our minds around the grace that Jesus is talking about, so that today at least we'll understand a little bit more about the grace that our Lord Jesus came to deliver into our hearts. We ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, one of the first things that we need to know about grace is that grace is... Uh, expected of certain people. So my first point is, where is biblical play grace accept, expected? Uh, where will we, are we supposed to see grace? And the first story I give you is about Dr. Paul Brandt. Dr. Paul Brandt was a doctor in charge of leprosy, transmissible diseases. He worked in India all his life, and he had helped the lepers in a leper colony, served them in South India many times. These uh, low, low, low caste people, rejected by their family, and those that are able to go home for a short visit when they are cured are also when they go home, they don't sleep in the house. They may just be given a place outside the house. So there are people who are rejected by society. 
And because of this work, one thing is this. Brand transmitted grace. So how do we gain, how do we learn about grace? We only learn about grace when we experience grace. Or somebody has graced us. Or somebody has extended grace to us. Then we'll be able to learn something about grace. The second thing I need you to know where the grace is supposed to be, to be expected is not only from individuals who have experienced grace, but uh, the church of Jesus. The church of Jesus is expected to practice grace. And the verse I want to share with you is found in Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. He tells us about the fact that God has extended grace to those of us individually who have come to know Jesus. We have received grace. We have, those of us who have re- learned how to receive grace. God also raises us up together. Raises us up. In other words, God raised up the church and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is just biblical language to say that once we have tasted of the grace of Jesus, we, have a, we are seated with the authority that Jesus has given to us and the ability that he has given to us for a specific goal. And God's goal is this, that in the ages to come, He, God, might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ. Let me just put it in very simple language here. God's plan for those who are grace recipients we are given authority with Christ to take part in a big show. The original Greek says it is a show, a big declaration to expose it to the whole world. That's a big show. And who are the players in this big show? You and me, if you have trusted Jesus and you have tasted of God's grace. What is the show about? What is this whole show that we are, we, are, we are, as if we are on candid camera all the time, we are on show, if you are a Christian? What are we showing? The exceeding riches of His grace. Not only are we called upon to demonstrate His grace, but to demonstrate how rich, now the word is exceeding and some Versions use the word surpassing. Exceeding what? Exceeding human expectation. Exceeding the expectation of the people of the world. And this exceeding riches of His grace is what we are supposed to demonstrate. We are in a big show and God is using us, the key players, to demonstrate this show. Show of what? Show of the rich, surpassingly rich, the double superlative here. God is not only rich in His grace, but it's a surpassing riches. And we are supposed to demonstrate it. Therefore, today, if you are Christian, you have to learn how to be part of this show. Like it or not, we are all on candid camera. In the midst of the world, to demonstrate one thing, not how much we know about the Bible, but how much grace we have received in our lives. So, the testimony of a writer, Philip Yonsei, who wrote that well-known book, Amazing Grace. So, this is what he said. As I look back in my own pilgrimage, pilgrimage of experiencing grace, that is, I see that what pulled me along in my search for grace, everybody is searching for grace. What pulled me along as 
in my search for grace, I rejected the church for a time because I found little grace in the church. So I rejected. I found so little grace there. Yet I returned. I returned there because I found grace nowhere else. I found nowhere else grace. You know, that's why the church has been called into existence to demonstrate grace. Well, thank God at least there's a little grace. But the grace that the Bible is talking about is great grace. In fact, in Peter's description of the church, he says, the God of all grace, all, all types of grace, all forms of grace, this is a God who wants to demonstrate grace to the whole wide world. And we are all lacking in grace. So today we want to learn something about looking, first of all, uh, I'm going to give you a quick description of how Jesus demonstrated grace and then I'm going to finish off with a fairly long video clip of how one pastor demonstrated grace in a very difficult situation. So my description and teaching about how Jesus demonstrated grace will be a short one. Let me give you a few. The first thing is, Jesus extended grace to all. Those who are near him, the disciples. When Peter denied him three times, the Bible says, Jesus looked at Peter. Did he rebuke Peter? He never did. Three times Peter denied him, betrayed him, but Jesus never once rebuked him. And that doesn't make sense because it hurt him a lot. Thomas also said, I will not believe. And Jesus had to show him his nail scarred hands. And he then accepted. You know, the way Jesus treated people is so gracious. How do we see grace? The Word of God says he never retaliates. Those who hurt him, those who he came to his own, we read last week. Jesus came to his own people, his own creation, people who, who, who belongs to him. He's the owner of all men and all creation. And yet, his own creation, the people he created, knew how to hurt him. And they knew how to kill him. But what did he say? How did he demonstrate grace? He said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Those crimes deserve death, but forgive them. So one important part of a grace is to extend grace, a person must be willing to pay for it. And Jesus paid for it with his own blood. And then, because he's qualified, he took it upon himself so he could extend grace even to his enemies. He offered grace to people rejected by society. Uh, particularly the way, the way I would use the word is, the first part is, he showed grace by not retaliating. I could say he took the hits. He took the hits from people uh, without retaliating. That's the first way he extended grace. He took the hits without retaliating. Second, he treated women with respect, with grace, particularly women that has been rejected by society. Women who are what the world calls women of ill repute, prostitutes, and women that 
Nobody wants to talk to. People feel ashamed to talk to this kind of woman, like the woman at the well, or the woman who was uh, clearly known to be a prostitute. And when Jesus came to a man called Simon for a banquet, here was this woman. We don't know what's her name. It's a nameless person. Came uh, to anoint Jesus' feet, and he, Jesus accepted it. In the midst of people, Jesus was not ashamed of this prostitute. He extended grace. And then thirdly, the way he treated the down and out. You see, how we treat people demonstrates grace. So, who are the people who uh, finds very comfortable with Jesus because he treated them uh, decently? you got publicans, uh, tax collectors who are hated by the Jewish people. Uh, and uh, particularly the religious folks look down on all these people. In fact, Jesus had to tell a story in all his stories he talks about a tax collector, a publican who is rejected by, by, by people. When they come before God and say, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus said, God's heartbeat was simply to forgive him. You see, when we talk about grace, it's not just only the outward action, it's the heartbeat. And uh, then come a religious person who says, Probably, I haven't done these bad things like this man who is a tax collector. And Jesus said, he prayed to himself. God didn't hear him. Because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And just because this man is down and out, rejected by society, but he came as an authentic person, forgive me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on me. Have grace on me, a sinner. One simple prayer and God heard that prayer. Do you know what it's got to do with? It's got to do with being authentic before God. And those who are hypocritical will not receive grace. So I've got a list of people here that were very comfortable to come to Jesus. Whether it be lepers that are not supposed to go near people, they are willing and they are bold enough to come near to Jesus and Jesus will touch them and they will be healed. Little children seems to be too playful until the disciples have to say, tell them, you know, go somewhere else. But the Lord said, let them come to me. Jesus got along well with children. Jesus got on with the worst people. The thief on the cross. How did Jesus demonstrate his treatment of the down and out? When on the cross, there was a thief on the right and the left, and both of them had been speaking badly about Jesus. In fact, not only these two thieves, but those passerbys had nasty things to say about Jesus as he hung on the cross. Yet, toward the end of Jesus' crucifixion, before he died, when the thief changed his mind at the last moment, at the eleventh hour when the thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And yet, just one sentence. You know, this guy is a thief. He would never do anything good. Well, he's, at least it's not proven. All his life he had been stealing. He must have been stealing and killing someone. That's why he was crucified. There's nothing good. But one sentence. Remember me. And Jesus said, Today, I remember you. 
you'll be with me in paradise. That's grace. Does the thief deserve? Absolutely not. What is he coming on the basis? Mercy. Do you know one of the most common prayers throughout the book of Psalms is a prayer for mercy. Psalm 25, Lord, remember mercy. When dealing with me, Lord, remember mercy. Psalm 89, again, remember mercy. No, the psalmist always appealed to the mercy of God, to the grace of God, not on their own merits, because they know that their merits will never be good enough. So, even Jeremiah says, in his time of sadness, he says, it is of the Lord's mercies that I'm not consumed. I deserve to die, but it is the Lord's mercies. And they are new every morning. Do you know you and I need, when we start every morning, every new day, it's dependent on the mercies of God. That's why in Psalm 89, the psalmist writes, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will sing about what? God's grace, God's mercies, because I know I don't deserve it. It's an interesting uh, music written by uh, Mozart, and he would play this song, and in this last phrase he says, Remember, Lord, I am. Remember mercy, Lord. Uh, this is a piece of music that is being used for burials and funerals. And in this music, there is one phrase that says, Remember me, Lord Jesus, because remember that I am the reason you made your journey. You made your journey to planet Earth. Remember, Lord, I'm the reason. Yeah, I'm not worthy, but I'm the reason why you came. You know, as Christmas approach, just remember we are the reason that Jesus suffered and died. That's why we can appeal to His mercy. Lord, I'm the reason why you came. And when you came, you knew you had to die and, and you came to your own, but your own knew exactly how to inflict pain on you. But nonetheless, Lord, remember mercy. Because I'm the reason why you came. I'm the lost sheep. And one of the most difficult things uh, is uh, his teaching. Okay, we talk about how Jesus uh, took the hit. He demonstrated grace. Second, how he treated people, especially down and out people, demonstrate grace. Thirdly, he demonstrated grace through his teachings. Now, the teachings of Jesus are quite hard to understand because the perspective of grace here talks about God's heartbeat. It seems to contradict the law. Sometimes it's so difficult to understand this together. Take the three stories that Jesus put in a series called The Prodigal Son, The Lost Coin the lost sheep, the lost son. All of us know these stories. But you know what's the behind these th three lost things? is the heartbeat of God, which is very hard to understand. We tell the story of the prodigal son, and we say how he went to a far country. We know the description and uh, how he wasted his money, and then he suffered, uh, worked for, uh, in a pig, uh, take care of pigs, and uh, he came to his senses. And then that famous picture drawn by Rembrandt is one of the most touching pictures of grace because here is this boy coming home with broken slippers, smelly clothing, and hungry, lean and hungry look coming home. We know this story very well. But our perspective of this story is mostly wrong. 
Here is the story about a father who gave his son, this second son, all the wealth that he asked for before the time is due and he wasted everything and then came home. And the father's heart was what we call the heart of a lovesick father, waiting. And he did everything that is wrong according to the law. Why is it wrong? First, he ran to meet his son. Look, the stately father don't run. You, the son, you wasted all the money. You walk humbly back to the house. Not I run to meet you at the main gate. But the father ran. Secondly, he hugged his son. Now, the son was about to apologize. By right, the son should say, I'm so sorry, I wasted your money. He must repent first. How come he didn't repent yet? The father go and hug him and welcome him. Worse still, he immediately asked for a new set of clothes for him to be clothed with the cloth, clothing of a, a, a wealthy family. And then after that, what? Ask for an immediate celebration, the fettered calf to be killed. And of course, the elder brother was very upset. He said, what is this? You are doing all the wrong things, father. Firstly, you are rewarding a person for doing the wrong thing. What kind of image are you trying to teach? The father seems to have done everything that's wrong according to the law. But that's grace. The word is undeserved. What he did not deserve mercy. And the father was overjoyed. Why? The key word was, he was once was lost, but now is found. Once was lost, and now is found. Why is this finding something lost more exciting than having not lost at all. So the young older brother is right in many ways according to the law. Why are you rewarding uh, someone for bad performance? Uh, are you trying to encourage people to sin? No, this is the heartbeat of God. It's, it's hard to understand. So that's why Jesus gave three pictures. He would talk about the woman with the lost coin. It's the same concept. The woman lost her coin, her silver coin. And uh, she worked hard to look for it. And when she found it, she had more joy in this one single coin that was lost than all the coins that she had. She had plenty of other coins. If she hadn't lost this coin, would she have joy in the coins that she had? Yes, she would. But that's nothing compared to the coin that was lost and was found. So thirdly, there was a story of the lost sheep. The lost sheep, there were 99. He had 100 sheep. He left 99 in the wilderness and went out to look for the sheep. Don't know where this lost sheep has gone. He was lost. Isn't 99 economically worth far more than this silly sheep that has gone lost? Isn't 99 more wealth, uh, more value than one that is lost? Of course, economically, 99 is worth far more. He can give up that one that is lost. But now he left the sheep in the fold and went out looking. For that one lost sheep. That's grace. That's exactly what Jesus had done. He left all the angels and all the wealth in heaven and came down looking for the lost. And you and I are the lost ones he's looking for. Why? Because it gives him more joy in finding that one lost sheep than the 99 that was not lost at all. If you can get that feeling that emotional feeling of one who, who, who uh, found something that was 
presume lost. You invested some money and when it was lost, you know you are very disappointed. But then when it turned out that, oh, it was a mistake, actually you, it was not lost, the investment was still there and you got it back. That's a different feeling, right? The feeling of joy. That's why the, word, the root word of the word grace and joy are, are very close. One is karis, the other is kara. Both the heart of joy when finding something you have lost. So this is basically about the heartbeat of God. It doesn't make economic sense. For instance, another parable Jesus talked about was the workers. He, this rich man employed uh, those who came in the morning and worked for eight hours. The going wage was one denarius. That's a correct salary. But the last guy who came only worked one hour and he also paid him the same salary. Of course, the others were upset. So, it doesn't make economic sense. Are you trying to reward someone uh, so much? So the guy who came, who worked eight hours, would be, isn't it a disincentive for him to work anymore? No economic sense. But that's what grace is. God wants us to grasp that. And therefore, this parable is a very important way of teaching. And then, he, what I want to close off with today is this last part I've got in my notes for you. Because this verse says, in verse 16, it says, because, because his fullness of grace, because his, the grace of Jesus is so much, he's able to give grace upon grace. I'm going to explain this and then I'm going to show you the video as to how grace upon grace pan out in the life of this pastor, uh, Richard Rombrand. First of all, grace upon grace simply means God adds one grace after another. There's one aspect of grace. In other words, it doesn't matter what the situation is. His grace will be one wave after another. God's plan is that you will experience one wave of grace, of God's goodness and kindness. Then there will be a next wave that's coming. It's an endless wave. I use the word wave because if you stand at the beach, you see the first wave has come and the water has reached your feet. But you know, there's another wave coming. And there's a third wave coming. Endless waves of God's grace. That's what this verse is talking about. In fact, even the, the Lord's brother James wrote and said in <clears throat> James 4, 6, that we have received more grace. We receive more grace. And the original Greek says greater grace. In other words, each new wave of grace would be a bigger wave than the previous one. That's the meaning from James 4, 6. He's talking about uh, getting wisdom and uh, feeling, experiencing God's grace in this battle against the enemy. And uh, God says, one wave after the other need to be received. And therefore, uh, this video you're going to see is how Richard von Wombrand experienced grace in what way was it difficult? Well, he himself suffered being tortured because of his faith in Jesus. When communism came in, when communism overtook, uh, uh, took over Romania, the essence of uh, communism is godlessness. Now, godlessness always do not take into account grace. Grace is not in the vocabulary of communism. When there's no God, when there's godlessness, there's no grace. And therefore, he personally experienced a great uh, suffering because for Jesus. This is how it panned out and how the Lord preserved him. You're going to see this in this video clip. But the second problem is you need more grace. 
when not only you suffer, but your family suffers. That is worse. And especially like his son, Mihai, suffering from a young age, rejected by these gods, shouted at, experienced ungrace. And you wonder, even this pastor wonder, will he grow up hating God? And later on, Mihai grew to be an adult. God preserved him. He did not depart from the faith. He grew in the grace of the Lord Jesus. So uh, then how did he practice grace when as a prisoner under very difficult circumstances and uh, yet he practiced grace when he's speaking to the chief of police and imparted grace because even the chief of police that was in charge of his prison, he also needed grace. So you're going to see how this pastor uh, demonstrated. So now you have finished watching the video on uh, Richard Rembrandt. Uh, I want to close in prayer. And I want you to meditate on this promise because of the fullness of His grace. We have all received. We all are qualified to receive as long as we come humbly and as long as we come by faith. And then there will be grace upon grace. So I'm going to pray over this. I don't know what is the situation in a home. I sense some of you are going through tough times, difficult relationships. But God says here in this, there will be grace upon grace for you. Father, I pray right now that even as our Lord Jesus showed us what we mean by grace, we now take our place in the heavenly places, seated with Jesus, to take part in this great show, show of your exceeding riches of your grace. And Lord, I just speak right now, inner strength, grace for every one of us. In the days ahead, we recognize that there is no situation in which your grace will not be sufficient. We receive right now and take our place in this big show that you are having to the whole world, the show of your exceeding riches of your grace. Let your grace become evident in our lives one wave after another. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.